Well, I, uh, I uh, thought back, I was, I was trying to think back, what's the thing that really works inside of me? Like, what's really going on? Because it's not the Holy Spirit a lot of times. And I had this recollection of a, uh, of a time in our life when I was living in Chicago about 12 years ago, and we joined the Autobahn, and it's a, uh, it's a racetrack. You bring your car and you can drive your car, whatever car you got. You could, you know, you just got to pay to go, and you can drive it around this road course, and uh, and then you can buy a Miata, and you can race in the Miata races, or you can bring another car and compete in the GT class. And so we had a Subaru that we did some work on, and then we also had a Miata that we bought that was used, and we bought it from the club champion because we wanted to make sure it was fast, and we wanted to win, of course, right? And so we got the club champions. He was going to get a better Miata, and he was going to race in a different series, and so we thought, all right, we've got this thing all set up. It's going to be great. We're going to kill everybody in this thing. So we took lessons. Uh, we learned. We had uh, you know lots of coaching, and we were all getting better, um, but we're watching our times, and we were still not getting anywhere close to the top of the leaderboard. And we thought, well, we got, we're, we're driving the line, we're running smooth, we got the right car. What's going on? And the guy that was training us said, well, well, what gas are you guys using? And we said, we're, the, you know, the '89 octane, the cheap stuff. We're not, you know, we're using a lot of gas here, so we're, you know, we're running as cheap as we can. And he said, well, everybody else is running 110 octane while you're running 89. And I was like, oh. That makes a difference, doesn't it? And he's like, uh, yeah, quite a bit, dude. So we quickly learned that in auto racing, the fuel that you run actually matters a lot. So uh, the right car, right driver, wrong gas, you still lose. So, and that was kind of what reminded me of what it's like living as a Christian. I got my purpose from God. I got the truth of Jesus' word. I've been transformed, I've been forgiven, and I'm running on my own fuel and I keep losing. Hmm, sounds kind of familiar, doesn't it? As I started thinking about my life, I'm like, what is the fuel that I really run on? Like, what, what exactly do I run on? And after spending a good deal of time working on this uh, with some guys and a group of men for a while, I realized that the, the fuel I run on is adrenaline. I run on adrenaline, and it comes from fear. So I, 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 ha I have a deep uh, fear of failing. I want to succeed, and that every morning makes me wake up and I feel this adrenaline rush and I live off of adrenaline and it's the wrong fuel, I can just tell you that. The vast majority of my work days, I'm fast, I'm hard, I run long, I outpace people, I'm in it um, and it always feels like I'm on the verge of failing and so I have to push harder because I don't wanna fail and that's adrenaline that keeps me going, fear keeps me going. And I've been doing that for years, you guys, years of that. And it works if you want to compete in American culture. It works really well for American culture. But in the kingdom, God's kingdom, completely wrong fuel. 89 octane for sure, maybe not even 89 in God's kingdom. Very poor quality fuel. And I've learned as I've started to study men that guys run on a lot of different fuels and every guy you meet's kind of got a different thing going. And as you get to know them and you start really asking questions and getting to figure out what their thing is, you'll find out what a guy's fuel is. And I think you're going to uh, agree with me when you start to realize most Christian men are not running on the Holy Spirit. Most Christian men are not running on the Holy Spirit. We think we are, but we're actually not. You talk to athletes and they call it their juice. Bring the juice, right? And it's not steroids. Some guys do steroids, but I think we've all kind of realized that's just bad, right? So I think Lance Armstrong kind of made a clear, you know, the juice, that kind of juice is the wrong juice. But athletes talk about that, right? I'm bringing my juice to the game, right? And you're like, what is that? That's their emotional intensity, right? Other guys uh, get this sense of beating others, whether it's physically or mentally, You'll see it, you'll watch a little bit, watch some of your groups. There's guys that are always trying to spar with other guys, right? And they always wanna win that sort of intellectual tussle. And that's what keeps them going, they like that. That's their thing, right? That's how they get their thing. That's how they get their emotional power. Other guys, it's about finishing tasks. I'm a finisher, I get stuff done, I check the boxes. I got lists upon lists, and there ain't one you can find that ain't done. I'm a list guy, I get stuff done, right? And then there's other guys that run off the praise of others. And you watch them, they're fueling off the praise of others. And they're constantly doing everything to get some approval. 
They're approval guys. They need a lot of it. And so they work really good. They look good. They mingle well with people. They got this slick little approach, super smooth, but they're really good at drawing out approval and making sure people like them. That's another style, right? There's another one, control, control. Some guys like to control. They want to control things a lot. Big time control, making sure they've got their hands on everything. They're in the middle. They're making all the decisions. They're driving direction. They live on their control. Other guys, it's money. I met some guys that are super jacked about money and they get up in the morning. It's all they can think of. I got a guy that's in my CEO group and he checks his net worth about every 10 minutes on his phone. He runs a hedge fund and he's constantly checking his net worth. Seriously. So it's all about money, man. It's just that's all he's thinking about all day long is money, 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 money right? So it's the emotional energy that you rely on every day to get things done. What is yours? Honestly, what is it? What's that emotional energy, that mojo, that, that thing that you run on every single day when you wake up that's not the Holy Spirit? And you, and you know the right answer because you're Christian, so you know how to rattle off the little Christianese sayings and make it sound like it's the Holy Spirit, but it's really not, and you know it's not. What is that? What is it for you? When we become Christian, most of us men never discover there is a completely different fuel that should drive our emotions. God gave us our purpose. God did. He said, your mandate is to transform the world into a sanctuary, a garden, where we live with Jesus. And Jesus is the word of God. He's the word. He is the word. He's the truth that we hang on to. And that word is inside of us. And we memorize it, it's in it, and we read it. It's the word of God, it's Jesus. That's the second part, right? And then the third part comes now. And we've talked about both. First week, we talked about our purpose. Second week, we talked about our truth. And the third week, now we talk about our power, and it's the Holy Spirit, the fuel we need to live our purpose. It's the Trinity, it's the Holy Father, it's the Holy Ghost, and it's the Holy Jesus. They're all three people, individuals, that are critical to our walk as Christians, right? He told the disciples right after his resurrection, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised you, and you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. You'll receive power, power. That's what the Holy Spirit brings us. And most Christian men I know have very limited power to overcome their issues and to accomplish what God has built them to do because they don't realize the power that's inside of them already. My prayer tonight is you'll have a deep desire to switch on the Holy Spirit's fuel that's inside of you already, right now, if you've been a born again believer, and you'll shut down that old fuel supply and get rid of what you've been doing all these other years and start letting the Holy Spirit be the thing that drives your emotional energy. So who is the Holy Spirit? In John 14, uh, chapter 14, 16 through 17, we get a little picture of it, don't we? It's beautiful, if you wanna know the Holy Spirit, boy, John likes to talk about the Holy Spirit, and it is good, good, good. Here's what he says in 14, 16 through 17. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever, the spirit of truth. The world can't accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. He'll be in you. So he describes the Holy Spirit. He says, he, it's a spiritual person, he. He comes to live with the disciples after the resurrection. He lives inside them. And then Moses tells us in Genesis 1, 2 that he was there before the creation, so we know the Holy Spirit is God. So the Holy Spirit is a person, it's a he. He lives inside of you. He was with God, so he is God, he is God. In Matthew 4, we see the baptism of Jesus. The Holy Spirit comes down, descends, not a dove, like a dove. He's not a dove, God. He's not a bird, right? So if somebody starts drawing birds, that's not the Holy Spirit. That's a bird, right? God is not a bird, right? The Holy Spirit is a person. He's part of God's trinity, and he comes, and he's separate from Jesus, so we hear God speak to Jesus. We see the Holy Spirit descend on him, and there's Jesus, all three, The Trinity, the Holy Trinity, God, Father, and Son, Holy Spirit, all together at one time. It's almost incomprehensible for people to understand, but it is what it is, you guys. It is who we believe in. We're not polytheistic, we're monotheistic, one God. And he's the Father, he's the Son, and he's the Holy Spirit. 
1 Corinthians 12, or 1 Corinthians 2, 11 says, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. So if the Spirit of God knows the thoughts of God, then the Spirit of God is God. Jesus described the Holy Spirit with human attributes. Read it, it's in John. He says he comforts, he speaks, he guides, he convicts. This means he's personal, he's relational. He's very relational. He's relational with God, he's relational with Jesus, and he's relational with men. The fruits of the Holy Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, described in Galatians 5, they're all relational gifts, all relational gifts. He's relational. How do we receive the Holy Spirit? In the Old Testament, you see characters like Moses and Samson, Saul and David, and they're filled at moments with the Spirit, and then the Spirit leaves. So the Spirit's there and the Spirit's gone. We see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It doesn't mention them being filled with the Spirit. So the Spirit wasn't permanent during the Old Testament years. God would bring the Spirit upon a man and the Spirit would leave the man. But in the New Testament, completely different thing happened. The resurrected Jesus leaves and the Holy Spirit comes. Something changed. Acts 2, 37 through 41. Good scripture again. Acts 2. 37 through 41. Mm, gosh, I love this stuff. And Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. That's the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, man, when we hear the words, and this is what happened, you hear the word of God first, then we repent, we repent, we hear the word of God, we repent, confess our contempt for God, God forgives us, and then Romans 10, eight through 10 says, we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and we believe in our heart, that God resurrected from the dead, and then we are saved. That's what happens, you guys. You can see everybody in play, God, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, all in play to help us become saved. And the Holy Spirit is intimately involved in this process. Ephesians 1, 13 through 14 says, and when we believe in that moment, the Holy Spirit is deposited in us, deposited at that moment, and it's called a seal, a mark that guarantees our inheritance. It doesn't leave, it's there forever. So when you enter the presence of God and the Holy Spirit comes to resurrect you, that's there. And God goes, mine, boom, got it. No questions asked. The Holy Spirit is on you. There's no negotiating, no bartering, no nothing. God spots you because the Holy Spirit has been deposited you at the time of your belief. And this moment is called, when we believe, the indwelt baptism of the Holy Spirit. It has nothing to do with water being sprinkled on you or you would be dunked in a pond. It's when you believe and the Holy Spirit comes on you, that's when the baptism of the Holy Spirit happens. The water is an outward sign that that has occurred in your life, but it is not integral to the active, uh, activation of the Holy Spirit. Do not join those two together. The water is a symbol. It's not an activation agent. Your belief is what activates you and what causes you to believe. The Holy Spirit causes you to believe. The Holy Spirit draws you to God, right? Every believer becomes at that moment, oh, I love this. <laughs> Every believer becomes the temple of the Holy Spirit of God. Listen to 1 Corinthians 3, 16. Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's Spirit lives in you? He's in you. He's in you, you guys. If you've been born again, the Spirit of God is living in you right now, today. So when people say, come Holy Spirit, he's like, well, you're here. You're a believer, you're here. I don't need him to come, he's there. You're, you're here and I'm here, he's here, he's in us, that's it. He doesn't leave, he's still in us. It's not coming and going, guys. I didn't pray him in here. When you walked in, you brought him. When I walked in, he came with me. We are where he lives. Whoo, come on. Golly, geez. So what is he doing? He draws us to believe in Jesus. John 6, 65, no one can come to the Father unless the Father has enabled him through the Spirit, right? He draws us to him by convicting us of our sin. 
John 16, 8, he will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin. That's what he does. And then he seals us for salvation in Ephesians 1. We're marked. And then he enables us to do God's work. He enables us to do the work. We don't do the work so that we get saved. We get saved and then we do the work. This is what's important. Exodus 31, did you not love this guy, Bezalel? Who knows the guy, right? Man, somebody that's building buildings ought to name it the Bezalel Corporation, right? I mean, come on, this is so good. Exodus 31, he fills this guy with the Holy Spirit to build the temple, to build the sanctuary, the first one. He fills the guy, he's like, just, ugh. Everything you touch is gonna reflect me. Everything you make is gonna reflect me. It's gonna show up. The Holy Spirit in us, you guys, causes us to do amazing work that glorifies God. It does. If you're welding and you're praying and you're like, Lord, make this weld perfect. And when this thing gets built, oh my gosh, help it glorify you, man. I love, I've got this guy, that, I've got two guys that are, are, are fabricators in our shops and our plants. And when they get done building stainless stuff, it glorifies God. I'm just gonna tell you that right now. And I, for you guys that aren't in the food industry, that's, that's, I'm sorry, it's too bad, you're missing out, right? But you walk in and you see a polished stainless tank and that thing is sitting on a stand and it is ready to be used. It's, I, I, I cry. I'm like, this thing reflects the Lord. And you know what we do when we do that? We build lines, we, every single line, we gather around it and we touch it and we lay our hands on it and we say, Lord, the hands that built this glorified you, may this glorify you. May this be anointed for your purpose. We do that on every piece of equipment, on every single building we build, and that's what happens, you guys. I remember when we built our first home. My wife and I, we prayed with the builders. We prayed with the guy that dug the dirt. We prayed with the plumber. We prayed with the electrician, and we said, this is a temple you're building. This house is a sanctuary for Jesus. Build it that way. So when people walk in and they look at the brickwork, we can say, the guy that built that did it for Jesus. Does it reflect him? And people go, this is a beautiful house. It reflects God's beauty, doesn't it? Yes. And that's the work you do. As you do perfect accounting and incredible legal work, you're reflecting it in him. And that's what he did to Bezalel. He said, I'm gonna fill with the spirit so it just pours out of your work. And when people look at your work, they're like, why do your work so excellent? Because Jesus is in me. The Holy Spirit's in me, man. I can't not do excellent work. I'm building things to glorify him. It just comes out of you guys, because he's living in you. Paintings, churches, metalwork, sculptures, all created that just speak of God. They just speak his name. And that same spirit helps you create amazing stuff wherever you are. Children, families, homes, lives, businesses, wherever you are, teams, groups. You build excellence because it reflects the glory of God. And you have the spirit in you that can do that. You have the power to do that in you. First Samuel, you see David, spirit help lead him. This guy goes off and kills a giant, right? And you're thinking, wow, this guy's a stud. It's not shocking. He's filled with the Holy Spirit. God can do anything through anybody. And you look at Moses parting the Red Sea, and you think that's crazy cool, isn't it? And that could have been you. No problem. He could have put you right there too. You would have parted that Red Sea. Yeah, because you got that same spirit and you have the same power in you. And then the Holy Spirit helps us mature the body. And we're gonna study this quite a bit uh, here soon. First Corinthians 12 tells us every believer receives spiritual gifts. And the Spirit drives behavior to help us mature the body. That's what we get. So we get these gifts when the Holy Spirit comes on us. They're different than the natural God-given talent that you have. They're different. They're different. They're not always completely different. They may actually accentuate something that you're good at but they're different, they're not the same, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. The Spirit helps drive these behaviors in you that this God's given you to help mature this body, the Christian church. You have a responsibility to this church to use the gift to help it grow. You have to help us grow, we have to help each other grow. And that's a big deal, you guys, that's a big deal. You know, my, one of my biggest fears is getting up here every week and making a mistake. It scares me to death, I'm like, please, Lord, don't let me make a mistake, don't let me lead somebody wrong, let me do something stupid. And then I get done and I think, you know, if I make a mistake, they'll tell me. Somebody will tell me. And not because they're being mean or trying to attack me, but because they just want to help me get it right. And I'll make mistakes, and I appreciate that, you guys, because that's what the body does, to help each other, right? And help me figure it out. If I make a mistake, I know you'll help me. And you'll know I didn't try, I didn't try to do it on purpose. It wasn't malicious. I'm just a simple guy trying to do the best I can. So 
Those fruits of the Spirit are really important, guys. They come out of us to help this process happen and maturing each other. And then in Matthew 28, Jesus says, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing everyone in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. He tells them that, right? And teach them to obey all my commands. The Holy Spirit works through us. He works through us to lead people to Jesus. This is a key part of what he does. Listen to this. The man of God, filled with the Spirit of God, uses the Word of God to bring people to Jesus, right? That's what we do. The man of God, filled with the Spirit of God, uses the Word of God to bring people to Jesus Christ. We're leading people that way. The Word is a spiritual weapon that cuts through everything. It pierces the hardest heart, and it brings people to salvation. That's what it does, and all we got to do is bring it. That's all we got to do is bring it. Just bring it. You don't have to do it. It's not your word. It's not your stuff. Just bring the stuff, and Jesus will take care of the rest, and people will be saved because you spoke, because you step forward, right? You let the Holy Spirit drive you. People will be saved. You just have to speak, and you say, well, what about those who blaspheme the Holy Spirit? They're there. They are there, and we all know them, and the blaspheming of the Holy Spirit is that moment when the Holy Spirit says to a man, it's time for you to believe. And the man's sitting there, and he's thinking hard. And he says, no. No, I don't believe it. Jesus, I don't believe you are who you are. That's the moment when he's looking at the Holy Spirit and saying, you're a fraud. That's blaspheming the Holy Spirit. You've told the Holy Spirit he's lying, he's a fake, what he's saying is not true. And that's unforgivable, because that's the moment you have to come to Jesus and the man that does that will never enter eternity. And there's a lot of them who never will. And you will encounter them when you go to speak and share Christ. But that's not your problem, man. You don't have to worry about that. God's got that figured out. So don't sweat over it. Go to the next guy. There'll be another person there. Your head, the head count you save is not yours. So stop keeping score. That's God's. Now, the Holy Spirit does something really cool, and we're gonna talk about this next week. He helps you forgive people, and he helps people forgive other people. In John 15, the Holy Spirit leads us into all truth. Well, what truth is he talking about? Lots of truths, but one of those is the truth about yourself. He teaches you about yourself and why you hurt people the way you hurt people. He convicts you when you hurt, and he teaches you how to say, I'm sorry. You guys, there is nothing more powerful than a Christian man who's broken in front of someone that doesn't believe in Jesus that says, what I did to you was wrong and I hope you'll forgive me. There's nothing more powerful, nothing more powerful. There is nothing more unique in this world than that. And boy, do we need that right now, don't we? And even more so in the Christian church than ever, because we're tearing each other apart right now over all kinds of issues, and we won't forgive each other. God needs Christian men that'll be convicted by the Holy Spirit of their own wrongdoing, and be able to look another man in the eye and say, I did you wrong, man and I hope you'll forgive me. That's powerful. And why is it powerful? Because that's when a man learns about God's forgiveness. Why do you act that way? And he says, because there was another man, and his name was Jesus, and he forgave me, he died for me. And so I certainly can forgive you, because he already died for me. And that's when people start to understand who Jesus Christ is. God becomes real when you bring forgiveness, and the Holy Spirit empowers you to do it. How are we filled? The Bible was written by men filled with the Holy Spirit. Paul says, all scripture is God breathed. Peter said, all prophecy was spoken by men carried along by the Holy Spirit. In John 15, Jesus says, abide in me and you will bear much fruit. Now, since Jesus is the word, the spirit is energized by his words, right? He is the word. So how do we abide in fruit? Spiritual fruit, the spirit of the fruit, right? There's spiritual fruit that comes from reading the word. They're intertwined, you guys. If you want to get filled by the spirit, you gotta be in the word. The word is what fuels the spirit. And you see this all the time. When did the people get cut? They got cut by the word. The word is spoken, the spirit comes, the spirit fuels the word. They work together, they're in harmony with other. Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Jesus is the word, Holy Spirit comes, the two together make incredibly powerful changes. Transformation always happens when the Holy Spirit and Jesus are in the room. It always happens, that's what you look at when you see in these scripture tests transformation happening. Why, because Jesus and the Holy Spirit are working and these dudes get it done, right? When do you get filled? When you meditate on the word, 
You can't just slop your way through, guys. And a lot of you guys are really lazy in your reading of the Bible. You just want to slap through it, write some answers down, and come to Bible study, right? That is lazy, man. I'm just telling you. That kind of lack of discipline, it will not serve you. And we're going to talk about spiritual discipline a lot in two weeks. And we're going to really hammer this point. But this is really important. To somehow think that you're going to build giant biceps and a big chest by going to the gym and doing two reps? Seriously, you think that's going to happen, huh? Well, you think you're going to be filled with the fruit of the, fear, the fruit of the Spirit by just slopping through some Scripture and slapping an answer down and you're going to be filled. That does not work that way, right? You have to spend time. This is what Jesus did. He spent time with the Father alone in the Word, alone with the Father. That's when you can hear the Spirit speak. Turn off the headphones. Get the stinking ear pods out of your ears. Get out of your house, get away from the noise. You need quiet, you need solitude, and you need the word. This is how you hear the Holy Spirit. And when you start feeling these things, they're not gonna feel normal. They're gonna feel different. And you're gonna feel a little, eh, I don't like this. Well, it's a lot like you guys dealing with your emotions for the first time with your wife. Yeah, that felt really weird too, didn't it? Yeah, well, that's how it is with the Holy Spirit. It's a really awkward feeling sometimes because your old natural self wants to take over and you're really familiar with him. Like you got his play running well, right? For me, it's that fear of adrenaline thing. I got that down pat. Well, all of a sudden, these fruits of the spirits come up. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness. And I'm like, man, I, wow, I was like patient today. I don't like that. That's not me. I want to go quick, lickety split. But all of a sudden, God's like, slow down, Bill, slow down. Stop, listen, and you're patient. And all of a sudden something happens. Somebody goes, wow, you were really patient in that moment. You're like, really? Oh, why? Because I slowed down, right? I relaxed, I heard the word, I let him speak to me, right? This is when you start to get filled with the spirit. When we publicly share Jesus, like in Pentecost, Acts chapter two, Peter stands up, speaks, and he just unloads on these Jewish leaders. They're all the same people that hung Jesus on the cross. They're all still standing there. They didn't leave Jerusalem, you guys. They're still in Jerusalem. They're still there. And Peter gets up. He ran like a little scared girl a couple weeks earlier. Well, 50 days earlier. He ran. And now he's standing in front of him. And he's preaching like you wouldn't believe, right? Unbelievable. Filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. This is what happens when you want to be filled with the Spirit. Stand up and speak for Jesus. Just stand up and speak for Jesus. Stand up and speak for Jesus. And he says, I will fill you with words. Don't worry about what you have to say. I got it. Trust me, I got this. That's when the Spirit will take control of you. We experience that. And you'll have incredible joy when this comes over you. And it's often not a dramatic scene. Let me just be clear on this. It's not often a dramatic scene. Don't confuse emotion with the Holy Spirit. Please. There's a lot of fancy stuff going on that looks like the Holy Spirit. If it's drawing attention to the person, it's not the Holy Spirit. If it's drawing attention to Jesus, it's probably the Holy Spirit. A emotion draws attention to you. The Holy Spirit draws attention to him. That's how you can discern. If you're not sure, just test that, and you'll know right away what you're watching. When we serve Jesus, he equips us by filling us what we need, the fruit of the Spirit. He gives us what we need when we serve. When people are mean to you, he gives you something. What? Kindness, gentleness. They're mean to you, and all of a sudden you find yourself not snapping back, and you're like, whoa, that's not my normal bill. That's because the fruit of the Spirit just rose up in you and said, not today, Bill. We're going to do it my way, and you let him. That's big time. Galatians 5, 16 through 25, describes this battle of the carnal spirit and the, and the Holy Spirit living inside of us. And it describes these fruits of the Spirit. And it reminds us that if we, in John, in John 15, where it says, if we abide in Jesus, we will bear much fruit. Without him, we bear nothing. Nothing comes out of you without abiding in Jesus. Nothing. That's what he says. He doesn't say a little less comes out of you. He says, if you don't abide in me, nothing good comes from you, nothing. All the old stuff's coming out of you. The good stuff's not it. It's the eternal, the eternal kingdom stuff. That's not what's coming out of you. Don't think it is. That's the fake stuff. But when you abide in him, all of these fruits start to come out of you, this really good stuff. And he says, give up control. Let me run this. Jesus says, die to yourself. Because when you do, when you back off, my Holy Spirit takes front center stage, man. You're in the way. Your big, muscly, cocky, arrogant self is getting in the way. You're know-it-all, list-writing, list-checking, in-control, dude. You're in my way. 
sit down. Holy Spirit gets to stand up and you let him lead, man. Back off and you will watch the Holy Spirit come. He will come and he'll change the way you think. He'll change the way you have emotional patterns. You will feel completely different and times it will feel awkward. Sometimes you might even say, I feel like a fake sometimes. And it's because you aren't used to living with love and peace and joy and being kind and gentle. You're not. That's not a guy thing. And we're not rewarded for that kind of behavior much in our culture, are we? So it can feel awkward at times. That's not fake and that's not awkward. That's the Holy Spirit. You're gonna get used to that, guys. You are gonna get used to that and you're gonna love it because that's where the real power is from. Access God's power, not human power. How? Confess your sin and stop sinning. There's a big difference between repentance and regret. A lot of you guys regret your sin, but you never confess it and repent. And repent means stop and go the other way. It means stop doing what you're doing and go a different way. You wanna experience the Holy Spirit, you have to stop sinning. Talk with a trusted brother about how you're feeling. A lot of times our emotions are getting in the way. How do you deal with emotions? Talk to another brother, share the feelings that are going on with you and it helps relieve some of those emotions. You'll not, get, you'll not have those in your way. Pursue he helping someone instead of playtime. A lot of us boys like to play, don't we? Well, this week, instead of going to playtime, help somebody. Go do something nice for somebody. Literally, skip one of your play periods, one of your recess times, and go do something nice for somebody, all right? And you're gonna find, you're gonna find the fruit of the Spirit's gonna show up. Read your Bible, study with men, do your lesson, and think. Stop being lazy on your lesson, think. You know some of these answers, think about it. Stew on it, let your mind ponder the question. Stop being in a hurry. If you do a little lesson each day, you'll have more time to think. Think, the thinking matters, it changes you. And sit quietly, listen, and then respond to the small prompts. You know where the Holy Spirit is? He's quiet, man. He's a quiet dude, he didn't sound anything like me. He's quiet. Yeah, when you hear my voice, you'll know for sure that ain't the Holy Spirit. Like definitely, no, not the Holy Spirit, that's Bill. The Holy Spirit's super quiet. He comes in the quietest of moments and he's just talking just gently into your ear. He's a gentleman. He's peaceful, he's kind, he's gentle. And he nudges you and says, maybe go that way. I think that way is better. And when you settle down and you calm down and you listen and then you start to respond to those nudges and see what happens, it's gonna blow your mind and you're gonna do it again. And you're gonna go, I like this. I like the guy that's coming out of here because I'm not the same guy, I'm a different dude. And then the last thing is fasting and prayer. Jesus fasted for 40 days in the desert, 40 days. And some people are saying, well, why did he do that? Because when he got done fasting, his power was way greater than before because his desire and need for food was gone. It was not controlling him anymore. And the power of the Holy Spirit was reigning supreme. Fast and pray, you'll be more powerful. When was the last time you actively sought the power of the Holy Spirit? Seriously, when you actively pursued the power of the Holy Spirit, when was the last time? I bet for most of us, you can't even remember it was so long ago, or not ever. Most of us live our life quenching the Holy Spirit. In 1 Thessalonians, Paul talks about quenching the Holy Spirit. And there's a lot of things that block our ability to hear or keep the Holy Spirit down. One of them is sin, porn, lust, greed, natural desires, just wanting things, desires for the good life, comfort, fun, looking good. And then we have emotional issues, like for me, fear. Yeah, that's really blocked the Holy Spirit in my life. Anxiety, adrenaline. You know, you think about it, get up here, I'm gonna talk, I've got this fear, I'm like, oh my gosh, what if I say the wrong thing? You know, what if I say something that's not politically correct or it's on the wrong scale of the social justice scale or what if I get the theology a little off? I mean, it's, this is intimidating, you guys. It's really intimidating. And so you think about it, it's like, if I let that fear overcome me, I'm not gonna stand up here and talk. Are you crazy? But the Holy Spirit's like, no, Bill, I, I got it. It'll work out okay. So what's your emotional issue? Fear, anxiety, what is the one that's getting in your way? And then there's guys that have their minds getting in the way. They hear the Holy Spirit and they go, that's nuts. I ain't doing that. That's crazy. Why would I do that? That doesn't make any sense. That's not logical. The logical thing to do here is da 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 Their mind is way too powerful. So they're constantly second-guessing the Holy Spirit. You gotta quit doing that. 
And some guys just can't ever be quiet. They just can't be quiet. You guys with the earbuds in at the, at the workout gym and all that stuff, I'm like, take the dang buds out, man. Like you might meet somebody, you know? I mean, if you're, you wanna have a friend, take the buds out sometime. I'm at the driving range the other day. Like there's 20 guys lined up with earbuds in the driving range. And they're all, we all belong to the same golf course. I'm like, hey, I'd like to kind of get to know some of these guys, but you can't because their earbuds are in. And it looks like they're all on tour, right? You know, they're dialed in and they're cranking and they're looking and they're working it. And you know, you're like, come on, dude, you're gonna go post some 90 right now and act like you're a pro, are you kidding me? Take the earbuds out and let's have a conversation. Let go here, I mean, like, really? I mean, seriously, packed with earbuds, earbud heaven, right? Two, can't let anything in other than the earbuds, right? And some guys don't know his voice. They spend so little time in the Bible, they don't even know who's talking to him. Is it God, is it Jesus, is it the devil, is it me, is it my wife? I don't know who's talking to me because they're not in the word. They don't know what his voice sounds like. When you study this book and you read it, you know Jesus when he's talking to you. It's no, you, there's no way to confuse it, you'll know. He's, you gotta get in the word, but you're not in it enough so you're confused. And a lot of guys ignore what they hear. Man, I could have swore God said, don't buy that shirt, I'm buying that shirt. I could have swore God said, stay home and clean, don't go uh, bowling tonight. I think I'm bowling. I could have swore I heard God say, get your wife some roses. She don't like roses. That's ignoring what you're hearing. Why are you ignoring it? Stop ignoring what he's saying. And then the last is Satan's voice in her head, accusing you and lying. Bill, you don't belong up there. Stop talking to those guys. You've cheated, you've lied, you've stolen. You've done a lot of bad things. They don't want to hear from you. You're the wrong person, you're a bad guy, you're gonna do something stupid. Who is that? That's the devil talking, that's not Jesus, that's not the Holy Spirit. You gotta know who's talking in your head. So let me ask you, what is shutting down your ability to hear the Holy Spirit speaking to you? What's shutting it down? You gotta be aware of it and you gotta turn that off. Now how do you know if the Holy Spirit is working inside of you? Here's the biggest thing I'd I'd tell you to do. Start looking for small changes instead of the big ones. You're not gonna go kill Goliath tomorrow, trust me. That's probably not on your radar, right? You're not gonna go part the Red Sea. You know, you're not gonna push two pillars down and the temple's gonna fall. That's probably not gonna happen for you. But you know what could happen for you? You might forgive somebody at work that was, you had a real strong temptation to gossip about. They did something to you. Your normal thing is to go talk to your buddy over in the other cube. And you say, you know what, I'm not gonna do that. I'm gonna to go to the person that ticked me off and I'm gonna say, you know, that kinda of hurt my feelings and, and, uh, and I'm gonna ask you for forgiveness. And you, and you work on forgiveness at work. You can't do it at home, way harder at home. Just start at work. Ask somebody to church. Just ask somebody to church. That's an unusual first thing. It's not huge, right? But you ask somebody to church. This is the Holy Spirit leading somebody to Jesus and you don't have to do it. Ask somebody to church, it's a little thing, but you know when you ask somebody to church, that's the Holy Spirit empowering you to do that. You have an unusual amount of patience for a family member, that's a sign that you've done a good job and you're letting the Holy Spirit, you talk to a person you normally avoided, that's the Holy Spirit working in you. You had joy when you're typically frustrated, that's the Holy Spirit. You had peace when you were normally anxious, that's the Holy Spirit. You were kind to someone when you're usually rude, That's the Holy Spirit. You were gentle with your wife when you were usually coarse. That's the Holy Spirit. You gave time to Jesus when you normally wanna go play. That's the Holy Spirit. And you had self-control when you commonly explode with anger or you wanted to go look at porn. That's the Holy Spirit. Guys, recognize when you're getting those small moments where the Holy Spirit is winning and he's changing you. Recognize them and celebrate those and thank him because he's on the move. Bigger opportunities are gonna come. You're gonna lead someone to Jesus. You're gonna forgive your mom and dad. You're gonna trust God with a huge financial risk. You're gonna repair a restored marriage or a destroyed marriage, a broken marriage. You're gonna overcome a huge addiction to porn or money. You're gonna heal a sick person. You're gonna teach the Bible and you're gonna get some huge amount of money to the poor. That's gonna happen in you when you start submitting to to the Holy Spirit in those little ways. The big ones are on their way. When was the last time you felt an intense desire for the Holy Spirit. When was that last time when you felt that intense desire for the Holy Spirit? We've got this power in us, you guys, and many of us have not accessed it, and it's huge. And we live with an unstoppable force, the Holy Spirit, and it's inside of us, it's unstoppable. It cannot be squelched. And Paul said we're a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. 
And Jesus said, you're gonna do greater things than I did. The spirit is in you, he's there. He's there to make transformation happen. He would carry it inside of us. We're called to transform this whole world into God's sanctuary. And when we move into those dark places, the spirit empowers us to bring light and we bring life and we bring Jesus. That's what we are. We're men of God, empowered by the Holy Spirit and carrying the word of God with us. That's who we are. He's living inside of us. The first Bible lesson I taught was to a group of men 19 years ago, almost to the day. It's chapter one of Philippians. And I never forgot that day. I remember finishing and realizing words, ideas, stories, passion that had come out of me. I was in shock. I was in shock. I had given one speech prior to that in my life and it was on disposable diapers. I was an engineer designing pampers. And I gave a rousing speech on why this cuff would hold poop in the diaper better than anything else that was made on the market. And I got a rousing standing ovation. Guys, it was nothing like that. When I got done teaching Philippians 1, and I felt, I couldn't believe that came out of my mouth. I couldn't believe what I thought. I had thoughts I'd never thought. I had feelings I'd never experienced. I connected ideas I never thought I could connect. I didn't know what was coming out of me. And I went to some guy a couple days later. I said, what was going on? He said, you were filled with the Holy Spirit. I said, what? What is that? Who is he? What? Is that bad? Am I, am I possessed? What's going on? And he's like, no, that's the Holy Spirit. Do you know you ought to be reading the Bible a little more? I'm like, well, I'm supposed to teach Philippians. I haven't read the rest of it. I knew what I was gonna do the rest of my life at that point, you guys, because I knew what the Holy Spirit felt like. That's what he does to you, he changes you. How will you this week improve your ability to hear and respond to the Holy Spirit? How will you do that, guys? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we want to be moved by your Holy Spirit. We don't wanna be the same. We know we're not, we're different, we're different creatures. Your Spirit's alive and inside of us, Lord. Lord, help us get out of his way. Lord, Holy Spirit, come to each of us in a new way this week. Empower us in those little places where your fruits are just pouring out of us. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control coming out of us, Lord. And we're astonished at what we see. And all those old ways of behaving emotionally end. And we look very different at the end of the week, Lord. Help that be our week, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for living inside us. We love you, precious Holy Spirit. In your name we pray, amen. Thank you, dear brothers. Have a great, great week.